I am Galilea Gomez. My name is not Galilea Gomez, but in many ways, I am her, and so is everybody else in this room. Guillermo Gomez, who is actually in the audience today, was a soon-to-be father when he first came from Cuba to the United States. Terrified and excited, but mostly terrified. He was leaving behind all he had ever known, speaking almost no English. A few months later, his daughter Galilea was born in Miami. She was born to a loving family who had made the ultimate sacrifice. They didn't do it because they wanted to. They did it for her. I am Galilea Gomez, but my name is Amanda Nunez Bastos. And even though I was born in Mexico, I'm also Cuban, thanks to Papi, and Costa Rican, thanks to Mami. But amongst a conglomeration of nationalities, I'm also American. Now, we began this journey with a much different purpose than what we will ultimately present to you today. We got here asking questions that led us to another question that brought us somewhere else, but eventually we ended up here. I am Galilea Gomez, but my name is Angelina del Huercio Moran. I have a mom who's Ecuadorian, a dad who's Argentinian, and family from Chile. So really, I'm from all over the place, but I am also American. In my 10th grade English class, I figured out that these were all important parts of my American identity. Literature really pushed us all when reading A Cup of Water Under My Bed by Daisy Hernandez, where a young girl faces many internal conflicts because at times, she feels like she has to choose between English or Spanish, between being a Latina or an American. Other than empathizing with her struggles, I watched as many of my peers really pushed back on the fact that we would be reading a story like this one. My name is Miguel Escobar. I was born in Medellin, Colombia in 2006, but have been living in the US since 2018. Throughout my time here in the US, I have really seen how assimilation has shaped who I have become. I didn't always think that my story fit the American narrative until my 10th grade English class. Here, I learned that the American dream is all about people making a change for themselves to better their lives or the lives of their community. As I look out into the room today, I can see that we are all chasing the same American dream just like my parents, just like yours. In our hearts, we are all Galilea Gomez. Literature served as an eye-opener for us. After all, as Isabel Allende said, you can tell the deepest truths with the lies of fiction. Assimilation is defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as the series of changes that a person must undergo to become similar to his community, his or her community, by taking in their practices, customs, or beliefs. However, assimilation has had lots of different meanings throughout the years, and it didn't always have the negative connotation that it holds today. In the past, it was a way for foreigners to climb up the ranks of society by taking in its practices, customs, or beliefs. Yet, today, it represents a very sad reality that most immigrants face on a day-to-day -day basis, and that us three on stage have faced in one way, shape, or form. This is the fact that in order to fit into our communities, we must leave behind a key part of our identities. We wanted to focus on a way to combat assimilation. So we thought of maybe lectures or presentations, but uh, it all seemed overdone. So how would we convey this in a way that seemed more honest and would really strike a nerve? Luckily for us, our American literature class took us exactly where we needed to go. When our American literature teacher asked us what is American lit, the answer seemed super basic. Literature from the United States, right? We thought of great authors like Fitzgerald, Steinbeck, and Hemingway. Yet, we realized that American literature is not just for people who look like Fitzgerald, Steinbeck, or Hemingway. America was founded as a nation with no official language or religion. In theory, American literature should have been for everyone. 
As we began to fumble with defining what American literature really meant, we noticed that certain elements had tainted our culture into one of neglect. Whose stories get told in our community? Who has the opportunity to tell their story? Suddenly, in the form of these two questions were the answers to what we had been looking for. Maybe the best way to actually educate students is to try to change the culture that surrounds them. Service keepers have always been an essential part of our community here at school. Yet, we come into clean classrooms and bathrooms every single day as if it were a right rather than a privilege. We eat hot, well-prepared meals every single day, yet we rush past the cafeteria without saying thank you or having a smile on our faces. Our school prides itself in being a place where community building and belonging thrive. Yet, when looking at the relationship between students and service keepers, we notice that this motto might have gone lost in translation. Over the past six months, we've had the privilege to document the stories of our service keepers, always circling back to themes of culture, challenges, motivation, and of course, the overall American dream. We've come to not only meet, but to truly get to know Yaremis, Silvia, Elians, Eliseo, Evilia, Mirto, Osmel, Alexander, Guillermo Gomez, and Guillermo Vina. Their American stories are a testament to the fact that the American dream, although sometimes flawed, is alive within our community. Through these meaningful conversations, not only did we get to meet incredibly inspiring people and hear their motivational stories, but in the end, we got to meet the people behind the scenes, the people that are there for us every single day, even though some of us might not acknowledge them. Now, we want to introduce to you some of the people that really inspired us throughout this journey, people we got to meet through five simple questions. What part about your job do you love the most? Guillermo Vina was born in Argentina and went to culinary school there. Yet, he has been working for Miami Country Day School for around 14 years. When he started, he was the head chef at the kitchen. Today, he's the executive director of Sage Dining. He says that he's been able to see kids become teenagers and teenagers become adults. He has seen us all flourish. This, he says, is the most rewarding part about his job. What aspects of your culture do you still see in your everyday life? Yaremi Zagulin, a Cuban woman, had the opportunity to come to the US, just like many of us, with her parents roughly 20 years ago. Throughout her constant battles with language barriers and changes in culture, she managed to keep an indispensable part of her identity with her, her typical cafecito cubano every morning. Just like Yaremis' parents had hopes for her future, she too has hopes for her 15-year-old son's future, just like many of our parents. What was your motivation to come to the US? Silvia Oliva was born in Cuba and came to the US in her 50s in search for better opportunities and essentially to reconnect with her family here. Even though she came as an older woman and knew absolutely no English, she really wanted to find a way to appreciate and elevate the country that taught her the true meaning of freedom and prosperity. So she enrolled in a couple of classes and eventually received her US citizenship, which she proudly holds today. What is something that is hidden deep below the surface that you would like the world to know about? Osmel Medina was born to a large, low-income family in Cuba. Throughout his childhood, he always dreamt of becoming a pro baseball player. Yet, his dream was cut short. Therefore, he vowed that whenever he had children, he wouldn't let life limit them the way he had been limited, by saying, Yo podía andar con un par de zapatos rotos, con que mis hijos andaran con un par de zapatos decentes. I could walk with a pair of broken shoes as long as my kids got to walk with a pair of decent ones. Today, Osmel's dream is a reality as his son, Aníbal Medina, plays second base for Cuba's national team. If you could give one piece of advice 
to someone, what would you say? Mirto Noel came to the U.S. from Haiti in search for better opportunities. He believes that here there are so many opportunities to be successful, that anyone who wants to excel can do so through determination and dedication. He is beyond grateful to live somewhere where the opportunities are quite literally boundless. These stories and many more were featured in our school's gallery as the featured exhibit through the months of November and December. Walking through the gallery, students, faculty, and staff got the opportunity to really know the members of our community on a deeper level. And it was just so beautiful to see how the space really came alive with the stories of people who have ultimately always been here. All these testaments came from five simple questions, and that is one of the biggest things we want you to understand today. Five questions can lead you to a deeper understanding of the world around you. A question to get to know someone can begin the process of a meaningful connection. Sure, this project might not completely stop the process of assimilation in our generation, but we believe that it's an important stepping stone towards building a community where everyone's stories can be told. After all, we are all human, and we all have a story to tell. We hope that through this project, students can connect with the immigrant stories that surround them and understand that these are their stories as well. All it took was five simple questions to build a loving, respectful, and small community that acknowledged everyone on an equal footing between us and the service keepers. Imagine what our school could be if we all applied these principles on an everyday basis. With a school that upholds the core values of honor, respect, wisdom, compassion, and purpose, we should all have a place to tell our story and make it be heard. Only then we can start fulfilling our American dream. <laughs>